Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to uh, the Waterloo AI uh, webinar series on uh, artificial intelligence machine learning for managers and executive series. This is the first uh, webinar in a series that uh, we plan for the month of October and uh, uh, November for especially suited for our uh, partners. So uh, no faculty members uh, other than uh, very, very few uh, who have been invited are attending this, uh, this webinar. Um, I will start with an overview on uh, AI machine learning technologies and uh, then um, my colleague Hamid will uh, speak about some of the uh, major applications of AI in the area of healthcare uh, application in the uh, age of AI. So I represent uh, myself and uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Peter Van Beek, who is uh, the co-director of the Waterloo Institute, and we welcome you to the third major activity of the year for the Waterloo AI Institute suited for our partners. Uh, so I'm going to go very, very quickly on uh, an overview on AI machine learning technologies, uh, which are powering the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, before I give the podium to uh, my colleague uh, Hamid, who's going to speak on a particular uh, application. So I am a professor at the University of Waterloo in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and I co-direct with the colleague uh, Peter, uh, the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute. So this is a very brief outline of what I'm going to speak. So I will give an overview on the world landscape and the economic impact of uh, AI. Uh, very brief overview on AI and machine learning, major impact on industries and businesses. And then I will speak very briefly as well on the Waterloo AI Institute. We introduced this before, but I would like to redo it again for uh, members who haven't uh, seen prior uh, presentations. And then I will conclude uh, with some remarks and then I will introduce my colleague Hamid, who is going to speak uh, to you about application of AI and machine learning uh, for the health uh, care uh, sector. So this is uh, the landscape, the world landscape of AI machine learning activity as a snapshot taken uh, one or two years ago, uh, showing the major activities of what is happening around the world in the fields of utilizing of uh, the TensorFlow platform, which is not the only platform nowadays, but it is one of the major platforms that people are using to uh, develop uh, uh, libraries and develop programs and uh, applications using uh, deep learning uh, systems. As you can see, uh, Southeast Asia, Europe and uh, North America, uh, the hot area of where things are happening, South America and uh, Australia and other part of the world. Um, let me put in context what is happening nowadays uh, within uh, around the world and uh, within a snapshot of what has been happening over the past 200 years, 200 years, there were uh, several uh, revolutions, uh, if we call them. So the first one was uh, mechanization of production, which is the water and steam power. The second industrial revolution, which is uh, on the mass production, uh, the uh, advancement in electric power. And the third industrial technology uh, revolution has happened over the past 50, 60 years in the field of electronics, computers, embedded systems, information technology. The fourth industrial revolution that many people are calling it, I mean, the uh, coming and which, which has started, uh, it's uh, the integration of major breakthroughs that have been happening over the past few years. And uh, many of them have been uh, powered by big data, AI and machine learning. Uh, recent and future impact of AI and machine learning on businesses, I mean, uh, has been huge and we have seen it, I mean, over the past uh, six, seven years and uh, it is affecting almost every sector of uh, the industry uh, and uh, at all corners of the world. I mean, there is no part in the world that now is not uh, using AI and machine learning and big data to improve and enhance uh, various uh, sectors of uh, the industry. Uh, reason for the hugely growing role of AI is the tremendous opportunities for economic development. As you can see in this statistic, which is a little bit outdated, uh, people now are expecting that uh, by 2030, there is uh, upward of $25 trillion uh, addition to the global GDP 
made by, uh, I mean, uh, caused by the effect of AI on uh, the industry. And this we would have never thought about it five or six years ago, as many uh, colleagues in uh, the partner industries uh, are familiar with. Uh, so this is what, what is happening. I mean, where things are being transformed. So there are a number of uh, enabling technologies that are collecting a huge amount of data. This huge amount of data is being uh, analyzed and is uh, uh, being utilized in order for it to provide enhancements to these various type of technologies, uh, enabling technologies in various sectors, whether it's health, whether it's finances, whether uh, it's uh, banking, uh, manufacturing, almost in every sector of the, uh, of the industry. Why this is happening? I mean, there is a perfect storm that has happened over the past few years and uh, three major advances have been uh, happening uh, over the past uh, between eight to ten years, which is uh, the availability of powerful computing processors and the huge storage facilities, which is namely uh, cloud computing, edge computing. A tremendous amount of data has become available to the masses, if we would like to call it, in the form of text, images and uh, videos, and uh, major algorithms have been also developed over the past several years. They were developed almost 20, 25 years ago, but because there were no uh, powerful computing processors and not uh, a lot of data, these type of algorithms have remained obsolete only over the past 10 years that they became useful and uh, usable by uh, large uh, members of the uh, industry. So here is a snapshot of what has been happening over the past 70, 80 years. Uh, we start, I mean, from the top uh, left uh, side where uh, modern computing, uh, if we would like to call it that way, started with von Neumann and then uh, Rosenblatt has designed the first uh, elementary uh, neural network system, which is known as the Perceptron uh, in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, McCarthy has made major developments in the fields of artificial intelligence on the sides of the development of the neural network. And over the past uh, 30 years, uh, scientists such as uh, Hinton, Benjo, Ash Midhuber have uh, made several developments in uh, uh, connectionist algorithms and uh, some of these type of connectionist algorithms that have been developed almost 30 years ago are being used nowadays because of the advances made in the various uh, areas of machine learning and AI. So as you can see here from this definition, AI, the effort to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by humans, that's a generic definition. Machine learning, an algorithm to discover data for prediction and classification. Deep learning is uh, even more specific type of algorithm which involve hierarchical and multi-layer data representations as I'm going to show in the next uh, slides. So AI is a superset of machine learning and deep learning if we call it that way. As we can see in this uh, picture that I borrowed from uh, blog posts, you can see the overall uh, picture artificial intelligence which started in the 1950s and then you have the subsets of machine learning, which started really uh, development in the mid 70s, early 80s. And then deep learning, we say that it started 2010, but actually it started into 1992, 93, but only people have started to know about uh, deep learning algorithms uh, around 2010, because there were no powerful processor used to power these type of uh, algorithms. And this is a mixture of several type of areas that are uh, uh, where we call uh, AI, machine learning and uh, big data. So many of these type of areas are um, uh, powering what we call today the AI machine learning uh, engines. And you can see data, deep learning, predictive analytics, statistics, natural language processing, all of them are tools of whether artificial intelligence or deep learning or machine learnings. So you can see that uh, these type of areas are interconnected with each uh, other. Uh, there were two major areas of AI, if we can uh, call it this way. So there is what is known as foundational AI, 
and which consists of machine learning, probabilistic models, intelligent agents, data science and analytics, human machine interactions. So these are the core of the AI type of technology. So these core technologies that have been the basis of uh, foundational artificial intelligence. And on the other side, there is what is known as operational AI. So operational AI is mostly uh, the application of AI to various type of industries and various type of um, tools that have been used by these uh, industries. So these type of tools have been uh, dependable, accessible, secure, compact, uh, transparent type of tools that we call them operational AI based tools. And these are the tools that are powering the technology that we call today AI and machine learning. Very, very brief here, machine learning in brief. Many of you might be familiar with this uh, type of picture. So in the upper uh, row, you can see uh, we have amount of data. Then we have algorithms that are trying to find patterns within this data. And then we recognize these type of uh, patterns in the form of structured patterns, if you would like to call it that way. And then we try to build these uh, predictive, what we call them predictive or classification based model. And these type of models are going to infer certain predictions from new data that are provided to the system. There are a number of uh, things that go behind the scene here, but mostly we build model. That model is later tuned up, is tested, is validated, and then we start integrating it with the new data to provide certain type of prediction. So you can see that this type of system wouldn't exist without uh, data. This is one particular aspect of machine learning known as neural networks. So neural networks are the cornerstone of today's machine learning, if we call them that way. It hasn't been the case uh, 10, 15 years ago, but with the major advances made uh, over the past several years in the fields of uh, deep learning, neural networks have become the cornerstone of what we call machine learning. So the upper level there is how to train a neural network. So we present certain type of data in the form of pictures here, and then we teach the system what type of data it is, whether you are presenting the data that is correct or wrong. And the error of the system is going to be fed to uh, the connectionist model or to the neural network to improve itself. And then the more the system is trained with more data, the better the outcome of the system. And the second, uh, the second row represents the deployments of that particular uh, type of uh, model. So we introduce uh, feature, we introduce a uh, picture there, and then we should expect what the system tells us about that picture. So that's what the system provides us. So this is the conventional neural network system. Let's look at what is deep learning, what it does exactly. So for the what we just spoke about a neural network, you have an input, you have a picture, you have uh, a speech, uh, I mean, a portion of a speech. And then there is uh, what we call feature extraction, which is usually done not manually, but through algorithms that are separate from the neural network itself. And then you provide these type of features to the neural network. And the neural network is going to provide you with what type of system it is, whether it is a car or not a car. So that's the output of the system. So this is the conventional neural network system. Deep learning is different from the neural network or the conventional neural network in the fact that feature extraction and the classification or the prediction are connected with each other. So the connectionist model of deep learning has the feature extractor uh, embedded within the overall structure of the neural network. And this type of feature extractor are basically layers within the connectionist type of model. So that's what separates neural network from deep learning, machine learning from deep learning. So one is made manually, the other one is made automatically through type of uh, extractor systems that are built within the structure of the neural network. So that's the overall concept of what we see in the area of uh, deep learning. So deep learning automates the process of feature extraction. That's what they do. Mostly that's what they do because feature extraction is one of the most difficult components in the area of machine learning. So 
what we refer today as AI successes in various type of uh, applications are in fact deep learning breakthroughs. Most of what we hear today are simply deep learning type of algorithms that have been applied to specific type of uh, industrial uh, sector. So we see AI now transforming all major sectors of the industries and the businesses. So uh, from banking to insurance to transportation to education to manufacturing, energy, healthcare, media and entertainment. Our colleague uh, Hamid, who is going to speak shortly, is going to talk about some of the AI and machine learning application in the field of uh, healthcare, which is revolutionizing literally the field in that particular uh, area. So major benefits to businesses and the society. So uh, tools of uh, AI and machine learning are innovating almost every uh, industrial sector and they are providing major efficiencies. Uh, they are improving the productivity for small, medium and large businesses through the usage of data and through the usage of these type of uh, machine learning tools that we call uh, deep learning systems. Uh, transportation will become safer and friendly for the environment in the future. This is the next stage of mobility, smart mobility systems. Communication costs will drop, logistics and global supply chains uh, become more effective. We see that uh, in the COVID type of area and how uh, high tech companies have benefited a lot from this particular aspect. Cost of trade will diminish, opening new markets and driving economic growth, I mean, in various type of sectors. AI revolution has the potential of affecting positively almost every sector of the industry if we use it well. Some of the uh, application in the field of smart mobility, autonomous uh, cars, connected systems, smart highways and the advanced uh, ADAS systems. Uh, the area of uh, smart mobility also and uh, is, com is uh, contributing to the concept of smart city, which is booming, I mean, uh, concept uh, around the world, around several cities around the world. And all of it is powered by AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, the area of uh, health sector as well, in the area of uh, virtual care, in the area of telemedicine, there is a huge boom in that particular uh, uh, area and uh, mostly powered by AI tools. Uh, we see also other type of application, traffic assessment, speech recognition, image recognition, cancer detection uh, that Hamid is going to speak about uh, in a few moments, fingerprint recognition, almost every area is being touched by uh, latest type of uh, knowledge in the field of AI and machine learning. Very briefly about the Waterloo AI Institute, uh, for, which is organizing this, uh, this webinar uh, today. The Waterloo Institute, as uh, many of you know, has uh, been formally established in April 2018. Uh, it started working actually in uh, one year before that and uh, it aims at fostering communication uh, or cooperation actually between academic research industry and with support from the government. So uh, we have, I mean, university, the government, the government, industrial partners. And uh, so far we started, I mean, almost two years and a half and we have uh, registered quite a bit of uh, successes. I mean, involving the university researchers, industrial partners and even uh, government uh, agencies. The Waterloo AI Institute, some of you are familiar with these uh, statistics. So we, it is among four major Canadian research hubs in AI and machine learning. The other one being Vector, Mila and uh, Amy in Alberta. Uh, more than 180 faculty members are associated with the institutes. Uh, we have major uh, co cooperation. I mean, it is joint initiative between the two largest faculties of math and uh, engineering which are offering the largest number of graduate and undergraduate courses in the field of AI and machine learning. Uh, we have also researchers involved with us from the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, from the Faculty of Arts and Faculty of Science. More than $11 million of sponsorship funds have been committed or provided so far uh, for research in AI by large and small corporations to support 60 AI related projects so far. 
Waterloo AI main activities, uh, organization of workshops, seminars uh, in various areas of AI involving industrial partners, government and research uh, labs. One of these type of activities is the one that we are presenting today. We present from time to time short courses with, tuto with tutorials and pertinent fields of machine learning. We also provide short term and long term research projects. Some of them are six months, others are four to five years length through sponsorship funding from industrial partners. Uh, competitions, hackathons involving teams composed of faculty members and students also have been organized and we uh, established technical events. So we are participating in international conferences, workshop, invited talks and uh, congresses. And we cooperate not only with Canadian institutions, but also with the US and uh, international institution in Europe and uh, in Asia and in various parts of the world. Of course, with all the AI, what, what has been mentioned about AI and machine learning, there are still a lot of challenges and the risks. Uh, basically, larger businesses have generally benefited more from AI than smaller ones, but this is changing. So AI is machine learning tools are penetrating even smaller uh, businesses. AI hasn't reached uh, maturity yet, so there are a lot of uh, uh, potential for there is a lot of potential for AI and uh, their application. Deep learning algorithms are also being improved since they are not transparent and they lack explainability. There is quite a bit of research work being done in these particular fields. Uh, there are some issues, trust in AI, fairness and bias in machine learning uh, that uh, are being tackled also by a research institution and uh, research uh, centers as well. More funding required for AI for social goods is being provided. The AI Institute has been a uh, recipient of some of this uh, funding and we are looking forward for additional funds. So that's in a very uh, brief nutshell an introduction on AI machine learning and the context of the um, Waterloo AI Institute, what we do and what we intend to continue uh, in the future. Uh, this said, so uh, I will accept later on questions uh, at the same time as uh, my colleague Hamid, who is going to uh, present the next uh, components of this uh, webinar. And he's going to talk about one particular application I just mentioned in uh, my talk here, which is in the healthcare industry. So he's going to talk about one specific aspect where he has done some work uh, on it over the past uh, several years. <coughs> so let me introduce Hamid very briefly. So uh, our colleague Hamid is a colleague uh, here, professor in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo since 2001. He leads the Chemia Lab uh, at the university and uh, his research activity since 1993 uh, have encompassed the world of artificial intelligence, computer vision and medical imaging, where he has made several type of uh, uh, advancement and innovation. Uh, he has developed several algorithms in the field of medical image filtering, segmentation and search. He is the author of two books for 14 book chapters and more than 150 publication journals and conference uh, papers. Uh, Dr. Hamid has industrial extensive industrial experience and has worked with numerous companies. He is also uh, an affiliate faculty with the Vector Institute in Toronto and uh, an affiliate uh, and an associate member of the Waterloo uh, AI uh, Institute at University of Waterloo. Welcome uh, Hamid and thank you everyone for uh, listening and I will give the uh, floor to uh, my colleague Hamid. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gray and Professor Hamid for organizing this and providing the opportunity to talk uh, to the community at large. Um, and uh, so today, as Professor Gray mentioned, we want to talk about uh, AI in healthcare uh, specifically, and maybe grab two major parts of AI, computer vision and NLP, natural language processing, and look at them with a closer look, uh, uh, see what is happening. So as it was mentioned, I'm. Um, uh, leading the Chemia Lab at the University of Waterloo, member of Waterloo AI Institute and affiliate to the Vector. Uh, I've been working on artificial intelligence and medical imaging uh, for quite some time, so hopefully uh, sharing a little bit of that work uh, will be useful to some of you. 
So uh, there, just as a motivation why uh, somebody needs to look at application of new technologies in healthcare. So just looking at US as, a, as the market that is 50% of the world market basically with respect to anything, uh, we have 12 million diagnostic errors every year. So just in US and 28% of those diagnostic mes mistakes are life threatening and result in death or permanent disability. Breast cancer is a is a good example for that or a bad example. So four billion dollars per year, the cost of misdiagnosis. So it's it's a it's a major problem. It's not a it's not the only problem, but misdiagnosis is a major problem. And we beyond that, we basically uh, lose and waste seven hundred billion dollar uh, in U.S. alone again annually. There are a lot of statistics for U.S. as the largest market internationally. So patients and their families, they have to uh, pay for lifelong care for permanent disability, lost income, uh, hospitals face uh, lawsuits and businesses uh, lose talent and, uh, and have increased insurance payouts. All those factor in. All these are motivations to look for um, new technologies that can make our healthcare more efficient, more accurate, more reliable. So. Uh, what what can one do with AI in healthcare? There's a long list that I, I can provide and we can maybe talk about some of it because of the shortness of the time. Of course, machine learning, uh, as Professor Curry was mentioning and providing a, a good uh, introduction to that. So neural networks and deep learning are being used in AI. Natural language processing is a major force for processing uh, reports and notes and uh, uh, questions and conversational AI. Rule-based uh, uh, expert systems, they are not dead in spite of the massive success of uh, deep learning. Rule-based uh, expert systems are still relevant and can be used in many cases where we don't have access to huge uh, databases, but we have access to experts. Physical robots, uh, they are not as big as at the moment as the as the software solutions, but they are uh, a major driving force. Um, robotic process automation, of course, diagnosis and treatment applications, patient engagement and adherence applications, administrative applications. There are a lot of uh, fields where machine learning and AI is uh, is providing uh, uh, new solutions, new perspective and new horizons uh, for the healthcare industry. <clears throat> The opportunity is basically big data because the success of uh, recent success of machine learning lives from data. If there is no data, there is no artificial intelligence. And uh, if you look at that, the number of medical images and corresponding reports and notes, the text document associated doubles every five year. And that's mainly unstructured data. So there is there is no way that we can tap into those a lot of wisdom and uh, knowledge that is being acquired on a daily basis, but they are not structured, so we cannot use them. So, and that's, for example, when we talk about medical imaging, two trillion images per year alone, that's 450 exabyte, which is for, if you look at the data of the past 10 years, that's four and a half zettabyte, which is almost four and a half billion terabyte of information that one has to provide. That's, that's a challenge, but that's actually the opportunity to use uh, AI in healthcare. So when we talk about healthcare tasks, data, devices, we mainly uh, look at either software or hardware. My, my work is mainly on the software side. So you deal with images, with text, with numbers, and then you can use computer vision, natural language processing, machine learning to process different type of data. If you have images or text or numbers. When we talk about num uh, hardware, <clears throat> We are talking about robots explicitly or machines. And again, computer vision and machine learning in some sort of combination are used uh, to enable uh, new uh, functionalities for those devices. All of that base is based on the three main uh, pillars of uh, AI, which is algorithmic methods, knowledge-based methods, and topological methods. Topological methods is what uh, Professor Carey mentioned and named them as connectionist method, which is another terminology more established than topological methods. So basically neural networks, artificial neural networks. So uh, a, a, a very big uh, application of machine learning is precision medicine. And when we talk about precision medicine, basically people mean predicting what type of treatment protocol uh, is, should be choose to succeed when we are treating a patient 
based on various uh, variables that we have for patient age, uh, uh, different other factors, genes, ethnicity sometimes, and so on and so on. So how can we do that? How can we predict the best outcome, uh, uh, best treatment to have the best outcome for a given patient? So that's a major focus of precision medicine that can be enabled by machine learning. When we talk about learning, uh, uh, Professor Curry showed a much more comprehensive uh, overview that I'm about to. I'm trying to oversimplify things such that we can in such a short time get a good uh, in-depth overview. So we have basically in AI, we have three types of learning. We have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and weekly supervised learning. When you talk about supervised, it basically you have algorithmic or topological, so connectionist approach. Unsupervised, you are talking about grouping, clustering, and searching in the data to match patterns. And weekly supervised is when you learn from interaction by going online uh, and interacting with the human expert to learn from him. Again, learning is uh, uh, very important to distinguish that when we talk about supervised learning in AI, there is a teacher and that teaching is embedded in labeled data. That's a very expensive way of doing AI because you need experts to, uh, to label your data. You need a lot of ex experience and expertise, and you have to look at the variability of data and so on. Weekly supervised, you don't need label data, but you need to define some sort of reward and punishment and define the channel of communication between your expert and the AI solution such that you can provide uh, a feedback to the AI, whether the AI is doing a good job or bad job. That's the so-called relevance feedback uh, in, let's say, image retrieval systems. When we talk about unsupervised learning, there is no teacher and you are operating on raw data. And that's, of course, the preference in between the AI community. The AI community is massively pushing, in spite of the, the huge success that we, everybody is experiencing, is because of labeled data, because you can provide highly accurate models for really challenging problems. But we know that we have to move in unsupervised direction, such that the AI techniques can operate on large archives of raw data without expensive uh, 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 labor for labeling data. So again, my, my, my uh, classification of AI here is uh, a little bit uh, oversimplistic uh, compared to what Professor Kare showed. If you look at the AI as a general, machine learning is a part of it. Uh, don't take the size uh, too seriously. This is just a schematic. And within machine learning, we have the artificial neural networks. We have other techniques like support vector machines, which are classifiers. We have decision trees, which are 60, 70 years old. Within decision trees, we have random forests, which are collections of decision trees. We have natural language processing, which is a big deal because then it can operate on uh, a lot of text documents and written knowledge that we have. Methods like LSTM and BERT that I will talk about a little bit about come as a subsection of a uh, subsector of natural language processing. We have fuzzy systems, which have been driven to the side a little bit. Not everybody may agree that they are part of uh, uh, machine learning, but they are not. They don't have explicit learning capability, but they are definitely as expert systems part of general uh, AI scheme. We have meta heuristic optimization, uh, which again may be a little bit outside of machine learning and AI because they look at uh, stochastic search and things like that, evolutionary algorithm and so on. Deep learning that everybody is talking about is a small part of artificial neural network, which is a small part of machine learning, which is a small part of AI. So, but that very small part, tiny part of AI has been responsible for biggest success stories in the recent four or five years. So uh, one has to keep the overview that we still have a huge repository of really um, good techniques that we can use in AI, not just deep networks. Uh, there are techniques uh, 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 and decision trees uh, classifies like SVM that are very capable and then can be easily used. So if, if you just go short through some of the lessons that we have learned in the past 111 years, if we start with 1901, which some people may just uh, consider the beginning of machine learning and AI by introducing uh, the so-called uh, principal component analysis. So if you have attributes like images and patients and reports that define the position of a patient, and then you use mathematics to compress that in a very low dimensional space, reduce the amount of data, and to get the principal attributes, the principal components that describe, let's say, a can cancer patient. So machine learning started with that, arguably. And so that what we learned from that, that less is more. 
and mathematics matters. So there could be a there could be an impression that one is doing AI without mathematics. That's not true. You cannot do machine learning without linear algebra. So it's important to know that if you are hiring people, they should know uh, the fundamentation or the foundational uh, mathematics behind machine learning. The, 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 uh, the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956 uh, when in Dartmouth uh, workshop, uh, leading scientists gathered to talk about it. One of them, uh, John McCarthy, that Professor Carey mentioned. We learned from that brainstorming is crucial. Getting together and talking among competent people is very important. So, and there's a lot of young talent, but you to, to, to lead something serious, you need competency. You need somebody who understand uh, the depth of it. And then you need, of course, young, fresh talent to push things forward. There are a lot of stuff in the AI that we cannot forget, starting with mice from Stanford, uh, expert systems, if the infection is meningitis and the patient has evidence of serious skin or soft tissue infection and so on and so on. So expert systems in terms of rule have pro provided the first foundation of AI. At the moment, they are marginally being investigated just because of the astonishing success of deep learning, but we cannot forget that because inference based on human knowledge is more than rules. Experts do matter. We need the experts. And if you are moving toward unsupervised learning, experts become even more important because you need the knowledge that is not uh, necessarily available in terms of label, but in terms of linguistic knowledge. So we need experts to do that. 1950, uh, 1995 was a crucial year that co convolutional neural networks were introduced by Lacun and Bengio. And they basically combine two ideas, multi-resolution feature extraction, again, as uh, Professor Carey mentioned, that is now integrated without, within artificial neural networks, and uh, a multi-layer perceptron MLP. So th that existed, the ideas existed here and there, they combined it, we had the new cognitron before that. So what we learned from that, that basically nothing is new, but literature matters. Looking at the experience of the past does matter that we look what has been done and then smartly put things together and come up with new combination. And in that sense, you have done something new. Uh, in, in 2006, it was one of the major breakthroughs that we looked at uh, uh, the so-called uh, so restricted Boltzmann machines that we learned if you have a deep network, we can train them maybe as the pair of adjacent neighbor layers and uh, in that way enabling the training of a very deep network, which was a crucial idea coming from uh, Hinton. And it, it's, it's important because it showed again and again as a basic principle of computer science that restriction brings verticalization. You customize, you specialize, and that's where the wisdom comes in. Wisdom is where we know what we need to restrict such that we specialize, and then we can do a job much more effectively than any other method, than any other algorithm. So 2012 was the last piece to enable the success. You had, we had the theory, we had the network, we had the data, but somebody had to do it. And then all the wisdom of uh, people like Hinton uh, uh, may not be useful if you don't have the young talent uh, to, to, to enable it. And uh, uh, it was applied, the deep networks were applied on ImageNet. You need, as the, as the Germans say, machers, you need makers, people who do things and the talent really matters. So having young talent that can take the ideas, the wisdom of the experienced colleagues and run with it and do something with it, go through the practical challenges in the lab and write code, debug the code, run the GPU, use the GPU cluster and so on. All that is important. It, it does matter. So it has to be combined with the experience and expertise. So to, uh, to start talking about the healthcare systems that is the subject, our subject today. So let's, let's start with natural language processing or NLP, which is a major application of machine learning. So basically we have two types of uh, uh, documents in medical field. We have unstructured uh, notes and reports on the left, and we have uh, uh, structured reports or synaptic reports, which are being initiated more and more. So on the left, you have something that a uh, pathologist has written for, as, a, as a diagnosis. It, it's just, it doesn't have any, it's like a, an essay that somebody writes. Whereas on the right, the structure has been defined 
by the College of American Pathologists. So, and then you have, everybody has to go through that template, through that table. So perhaps in five to 10 years, we have a lot of structured synaptic reports, but at the moment we don't, and we don't even have access to large archives of unstructured reports. So NLP can help us to categorize those reports and notes that uh, contain a lot of diagnostic and treatment uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, it can also be used for simple tasks like transcription of notes and interactions with the patients, between patients and doctor, but we can also use NLP for really complex tasks like auto-generation of reports. That's what some of the medical experts are afraid of AI, that say AI may replace us. Uh, if AI is able to report write reports for diagnostic cases, then what is the what is the position of uh, uh, physicians, which is not true because we it, it will shift, but it will never replace AI uh, would never replace in foreseeable future the human expert and things like conversational AI as complex uh, tasks in the healthcare system. So NLP has received a lot of attention. Uh, uh, if we look at, for example, uh, in the IPM Watson, what the applications like Siri do, it's a lot of applications that are being done with NLP. If you look at, for example, a pathology report, so on the left, and apply simple, really simple, uh, uh, trivial uh, NLP uh, techniques, uh, starting from TFIDF, uh, getting some statistics, trying to understand the semantic of reports, recognizing keywords and recognizing topics such that you can summarize and use the knowledge in a different way. For example, here, uh, an image, soft, uh, image search software that uh, the patient in the middle, patient 46, is the patient to be diagnosed, and patient 63 on the right has been found by the software through visual search, and the report has been retrieved and cleaned up and shown such that the doctor that is looking at the patient 46 can look at the, at the matched case, look at the report, and basically make a better diagnosis. NLP can do other stuff. People have looked at, staff still looking at uh, not just learning images, let's say through applications like uh, artificial neural networks and bag of visual words and all those uh, fantastic technologies, but also bringing the reports and using them also as training data at the same time such that we can improve the results. So putting visual data and textual data at the same time. And then when you go online and use it online, you don't, you just have the images. So because the pathology reports, uh, radiology reports, uh, 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 treatment reports are now included and embedded within what has been learned by AI. And then you go online and you just see the biopsy sample or any other image you can use that knowledge that the AI has learned from both images and reports. Uh, perhaps the most sophisticated system there is right now uh, with respect to natural language processing is BERT, is the bidirectional encoder representation from Transformers, which is coming from Google. And it uses a lot of different embeddings. So it looks at the location, it looks at the segments, it looks at uh, try to get the statistics and semantics at the same way. Uh, very different from other approaches because this is mainly based on uh, pre-training and fine-tuning. In pre-training, complex system is the most sophisticated system that I, at least I'm aware of. The pre-training doesn't need to label data, which is a really uh, makes it really interesting to just go through massive amount of data and learn the semantics. And then in fine-tuning, you can customize a birth system for any task, for any downstream task, so that and uh, that makes it really capable compared to, to other techniques because that's mainly uh, can be, for example, here used for name entity recognition. And you see that on the in the middle, uh, 4.5 billion words from PubMed can be used and taking the base from the initial bird coming from Google and pre-train it and then fine tune it on the right for the BioBirds, so from the general text recognition, natural language processing recognition that has been trained for any document, you customize it for a downstream application, which is biomedical or biological uh, BERT, and then there you need label data then uh, to customize it for your own application. And then you see um, uh, in, at the bottom part that you can see the problem, for example, acute uh, changes. And uh, so acute changes, and then problem is left peripheral soft tissue swelling. 
and the test is echocardiogram, and the test is ejection fraction. So you can uh, recognize the context and the semantic of a report. Other application is, of course, like relation extraction. What is the relation between colonoscopy revealed mass uh, and so on? So if you have a if you have a sophisticated system like BERT and you have customized it, you have fine tuned it for your own application, you can answer this type of question. Question answering, conversational AI is a huge application. So then you ask, somebody asks, okay, has the patient ever had an abnormal BMI? And the answer comes from AI. Yes, BMI 33.4 obese high risk because the AI has gone through the document, has understood the question and has understood the semantic relationship between the answer and the, between the question and the right answer. Question, when did the patient last receive a homograph replacement? And the answer comes from, from the AI part. So conversational AI question answering is very important. Clinical report generation, a, a huge emerging field. And as you see here in two cases, the black text is the initial uh, uh, report coming from the pathologist. The green one is the one that the AI has generated. For example, the first one you see the nuclei are severely pleomorphic, which means they have different shapes. And what the uh, AI has generated is basically saying the same thing, the nuclei are severely pleomorphic. So initial applications, initial results, very encouraging that machines eventually can, uh, can uh, auto caption and write reports. So when you look at images, here X-ray images, and you generate attentions, and BERT is fundamentally an attention-based technology that is driven, again, by uh, statistics and uh, semantics. What you get to the attention, so attention is all you need, was the pioneering work that uh, initiated uh, transformer type of NLP approaches. And then you can write in the disease detection, you basically generate a report, finding is left apical small pneumothorax and small left pleural effusion and so on. So you can generate reports. Is that good? At the, at the beginning, it could be a starting port for triaging for uh, before the data gets to the radiologist and the expensive uh, expert. Other application after the NLP are medical images. So now you go from text document to images, which are two dimensional. It could be also video type of things. So we have more than 700 billion images per year in the US alone, uh, from prostate MRI, uh, brain CT to microscopy. And we can use AI, machine learning, and computer vision to do many different things, uh, find something, measure something, predict something for diagnostic, for treatment planning, for intervention. Uh, again, the biggest problem we have is misdiagnosis. The question is, if I'm looking at an X-ray image, is there a nodule? Yes and no, because it can be understood if I miss it as negligence and failure to diagnosis. Uh, I, I could make an error as, an, as a radiologist because of a scanning error. I just failed to fixate the area of lesion. I may not recognize it. I may not detect it. I may make a decision uh, error. Almost 50% of error are just incorrect interpretation of malignant versus benign. And give you another example again for breast, 85% of cases sent for biopsy come back negative, which is fantastic, but can we reduce that without jeopardizing human life? So something happened in April because of COVID, which is immensely important in the medical field. Uh, and the pathologists for the first time when given permission to do diagnosis from home. So remote diagnosis from home, first time ever given to CMS. And this was huge. And everybody expect that regulatory agencies at the government and the hospitals cannot go back anymore. We initiated that. Now we know that digital remote uh, diagnosis is possible and which puts emphasis on digitization, which put emphasis on machine learning and AI and computer vision, because at, at the moment still over 90% of all uh, pathology work is being done with microscopy. And uh, so we need to go digital. That's one of the lessons that we learned from COVID. So the virtual microscopy, you have your glass light with biopsy and the pathologists look at it uh, under the microscope and then you can also put it in a machine, digitize it, and show the image to the pathologist. And that glass light has to go to the archive. If you digitize it, probably we don't need that. Maybe we need to help the block, but not the glass light. That's one of the benefits. 
the, the conventional microscopy has a lot of, I don't want to go through all the details, as you see, it's very complicated. I just want to point out that in the conventional microscopy, which is the backbone of uh, a diagnostic pathology, a lot of physical stuff happens, manual distribution, archiving, consultation, sending a glass slice from hospital to hospital, a lot of physical transfer, very, very expensive. Whereas when we go virtual microscopy or digital pathology, a lot of stuff become digital from staining consultation to archiving to uh, diagnostic consultation and conclusion. Everything becomes digital. When things are digital, then we can apply our fantastic machine learning uh, algorithms and uh, provide the human expert with additional information. So if you look at medical images, what is it that we can do with medical images? So we can take the image and classify them and say this is cancer, is not cancer, is an infection, is not an infection. We can generate fake images, which is immensely important because we can replace and augment methods to help them to learn better. And we can segment them traditional uh, traditional task in computer vision and medical imaging that you can uh, find a specific region, measure it. Uh, that's important to look at the morphology of cancer and inflammation and at the intensity of it, at the staging and grading of it, extremely important. We can also search for similar things, which enables us to tap into the existing wisdom of medical archives. So these are basically two groups of things. One group is supervised and the other group is unsupervised. We have to keep that in mind. Every time that we are making a decision to invest in a technology, machine learning AI for my institution, I have to ask myself that question. Do I want to go supervised or unsupervised? It has huge ramifications down the road. So there is two different approaches, basically. You can use AI software to make decisions, yes and no decisions, which means what? You are you want to get rid of the human expert uh, who should write the report. So uh, we are not there yet with uh, writing out, out generating of the reports, maybe in five years. Or we can use the same software to map to find similar cases. And then that would strengthen the position of the radiologist, pathologist, oncologist, cardiologist, any other expert that is using the data and enable him or her to write better reports sh in shorter time, more effective, more accurate. So one, ask, one is emphasis on classification, the other one on retrieval and search. So in the one, the pathologist, the radiologist is in the center of, uh, of uh, uh, investigation. Can AI replace human expert? I would say not. At the moment, no, because when I look at this thymoma case, uh, this tumor, I can give it to the doctor. The pathologist will give me an, a comprehensive report. Yes, his report is unstructured, but we are getting in that direction to get a structured report. If I give that to AI at the moment, the AI will tell me that's thymoma, but okay, why, how? What are the uncertainties, the ambiguities, measurements, recommendations? So. We are not there yet fully to have the full value from AI, mainly because we don't have access to large archives of both images and reports, but we will get that, not at the moment. So why search? Search is important because if you have AI algorithms operating on large indexed data sets, then the, the human expert can send a query and say, I don't know what that is. Have you ever had a case like this? That's like a virtual consultation. And similar cases can be found, matched, and sent back to the hospital, to the doctor, and say, yes, we had cases like this. And corresponding metadata comes with it. The diagnostic reports, treatment reports, outcome, genomes, everything that we have about the patient can be part of that retrieved information. That's immensely important. So this is something that classification cannot do. This is something for search, and that's why we are convinced that search is a huge part of AI and machine learning. So now if I can search within archives, I can search for the entire biopsy sample. I can search for a small part of it if I'm focusing on details, or I can search for a specific region within a biopsy sample. So uh, uh, new technologies make that easily uh, possible. And this is something comes that we call virtual peer review. And if a doctor looking at a, uh, a biopsy sample, this is a thyroid sample, and you send that sample to an image search engine, and the image search engine goes and finds other biopsy samples in the archive of a hospital, if they have been digitized, to, uh, to find similar cases. And you find similar cases and you can retrieve, here's the connection between images and NLP, computer vision and NLP for healthcare. 
that you can also retrieve the reports because those cases have been already uh, evidently diagnosed. So, and the, the interesting point is this, the initial image comes from a specific expert, pathologist, radiologist, whoever that is looking at those images. And the other images that we have found are coming from other experts, from other doctors. They have been evidently diagnosed. We know the outcome. We know the treatment was successful or not successful. And now this is what we call virtual peer review. So as if you are asking your uh, colleague, what do you think? Have you seen a case like this? This has not been possible so far. We had telepathology, teleradiology, but that's physical, is not efficient. So, but virtual peer review is much more efficient. So if you have a Cori image, a Cori's biopsy sample, and somebody's looking at it, and you find those cases, image and reports, computer vision and NLP combined, then basically you can build a computational consensus and say, okay, this is popular thyroid carcinoma, which is in our case, a relatively easy diagnostic case. But this has not been possible so far. That comes with the power of AI and machine learning. So uh, if you look at, we, we, we run search, search in more than 2 million images. You give a brain image and you find the top three similar cases. You give a brain image and you find the top three similar cases. You can visually verify that, that uh, the AI is finding the right images. Here is brain glioblastoma, for example. If I have humor, uh, if I have blood in my sample, I can find it. If I have, again, simple uh, 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 glioblastoma, if I'm not mistaken, or is low-grade glioma, uh, uh, you can find the similar cases and look at them. So you can look at details and look at big picture, and then you have access to the reports. So we did uh, an evaluation for this with the National Cancer Institute uh, public data set is called TCGA, the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, and we searched across everything. So when the input image come, we did not uh, we did not assume we know that's lung, breast, kidney, or brain. We searched in everything, and then we saw everything that you see in that uh, colorful circle that is solid color is the so-called right classification. The black lines that you see, the thin lines that you see in the middle are other connections. For example, we searched for prostate and we found lung, which was strange at the beginning. But then we realized we are looking at 20 times magnification, so high resolution, and the prostate and lung had both adenocarcinoma, so the same type of carcinoma. Then it was no, no wonder that uh, the, you are searching for prostate and you find lung. Again, from supervised learning uh, approach, from supervised learning perspective, this is wrong because you have you have uh, you train a classifier to recognize prostate cancer. It should not tell you this is lung cancer. But search is a very different technology. Search looks for relationships, and that's what we need to open horizons uh, in in medical imaging. So you can also do vertical search and say, okay, I have a breast image, only searching breast images or only searching kidney images. And then you can see that we can, we can say results are correct if I give you, for example, at the top LGG, low grade glioma in brain, uh, or then I expect that you find only low grade glioma such that I can, based on the majority matched cases, I can make a consensus diagnosis, for example. If you look, we looked at the numbers and it was clear that first a consensus is possible, uh, but also that only if you have enough samples, for example, for thymoma. So if you have 178 patients was enough to get to almost 100% accuracy with majority vote to make a virtual uh, consensus, a computational consensus diagnosis. And then for, for kidney and bladder, we, we made the same uh, observation that the more patient you had, it was better. It was easier to get close to high accuracy, which was which it had two lessons for us. One, that computational consensus is possible if you are searching in large archives of uh, medical records, but you need enough. You need enough. You, uh, and this these are raw data. It's not labeled data, which is the benefit of unsupervised uh, learning. We have. We have two publications that uh, uh, give you a little bit of information. Both of them are available online, uh, public open access. On the left is the Yotixel image search engine. As you can see today in, in, um, in a press release of one of our collaborators, Huron Digital Pathology, a local company 
uh, that is specialized on uh, digital scanners for pathology. Uh, the Department of Defense in the U.S. Joint Pathology Center has uh, uh, expressed uh, interest to purchase and has put a, a purchase order forward to purchase that image search engine for the largest archive of human tissue across the planet, 55 million biopsy samples. The technology behind that is your tick cell that is described in that paper. And on the right is the first validation that we did with National Cancer Institute, uh, data of 11,000 patients, 25 organs, 32 type of cancer subtypes. So both of them are available online. You can look them up and get a picture of what the technology entails. To just give you an idea, a high level idea about comparison of common AI techniques. So there are many, many techniques uh, like support vector machines, SVM, random forest, K-means, uh, self-organizing maps, SOM, K nearest neighbors, KNN, and CNN based, which is convolutional neural networks. A lot of that, I know it, it may be a little bit too much. Some of you are deeply involved. Some of you are just getting started. So I, what I wanna just tell you is comparing, looking at two of them and looking at the differences. So one is, for example, K-means, which is an old technique, a very simple technique, is unsupervised. It can operate on raw data, so it doesn't need a label. And the, the data size that needs to provide something reasonable is moderate. And the accuracy that provides is rather moderate, between moderate and high. And the design and training is easy. So if I'm, if I'm hiring somebody uh, fresh of the university and he or she uh, who has taken one or two courses in AI uh, in Waterloo wants to start with the K-means, I wouldn't have any concern because that's manageable, that's doable. It doesn't need labeled data. It's uh, easy to implement, easy to understand, easy to manage, it's not very expensive to train. But if I go to uh, CNN-based methods, it's the convolutional neural networks, which is the backbone of the entire uh, deep learning and machine learning and the huge success. Well, wow, this is a supervised technology. It needs labeled data. It needs immense num is, uh, is, it needs an immense, uh, immensely large archive of labeled data. But the accuracy that it can provide is very high. So it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to beat uh, deep network-based solutions with other techniques. You have to do a lot of other stuff, combine two, three other technologies to even come close to the accuracy in majority of the cases, at least. I have not seen any case that you can easily beat uh, a well-trained, uh, well-designed and well-trained deep network. But the design and training of a CNN solution is very difficult. So again, if I'm hiring somebody to help my institution and that uh, young, fresh talent is coming off the university, uh, I would make sure that he or she doesn't start with the most difficult one. Or if he does, if she does, at least there is supervision of more experienced colleagues to make sure that we don't go in tangential and we don't go in uh, wrong ways. So there is a lot of information available online if somebody wants to go uh, uh, take a look at the uh, foundations. There are online courses, there are a lot of good uh, videos uh, uh, from MIT, from Stanford, and from less famous people uh, like, like myself that uh, introduce the general audience uh, in, into machine learning and AI. It would be uh, nice uh, to take a look at some of them to just get an, get an idea. So, and if uh, we didn't have time, I didn't want to go into the ethical side of things. Uh, th there is one video uh, available that talks about the ethics side of it. Uh, it's absolutely important for us in the healthcare uh, sector to be mindful of the ethics of AI. Uh, what, uh, what new horizons open uh, to cause damage and to become unethical or to develop and deploy uh, devices and software and machines that could um, uh, and enable unethical uh, behavior and procedures is of course immensely important for us. And if you're interested, yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, watch that video. There is a lot of information going on about the ethics of AI. Compared to the other applications, uh, ethics, of course, is much more important for us in the healthcare. So I would, I would uh, rather stop here and hopefully we have a little bit more uh, time for, uh, for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamid, very much for your uh, contribution and for uh, 
an excellent talk as usual. And uh, we would like to take some questions now for myself or for Hamid uh, on the uh, presentations or any aspects, and we'll be happy to uh, respond to them. So, uh, Carol, could we open the floor for questions, please? Yes, so attendees can just uh, type in a question in the Q&A if you open up the Q&A sidebar. So uh, Dr. Ala is asking, uh, Ala, thank you for the inform informative webinar. So let me publish uh, the question of uh, Ala. Um, so uh, thank you for the information webinar. Model verification and validation is a serious legal mandate in highly regulated industry like automotive and healthcare, especially in safety critical features of uh, or health related services. Can you elaborate more on possible ways to verify and validate machine learning model at mass level? Hamid, this question is for you, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, validation is uh, much more important for us. Generally, we do validation in machine learning just from computer science perspective to ensure that we can generalize. That means we have really learned something and we have not memorized something. But we, in healthcare, we usually add another layer among others, we do external validation. So the, uh, the training and validation do with the tests that we do in machine learning. On top of that, in healthcare, we call something external validation, which is a data from another hospital, which was not even a part of neither training, no validation, no testing. So it's absolutely new data that comes from another institution. So we have to take additional measures to make sure that the data set that we have modality is not prone to uh, uh, any data set coming from specific machines and specific uh, centers that have some sort of bias toward the specific diagnostic cases and so on. So the, the question of validation, uh, fine tuning and validation after that is much more in, uh, sensitive for the healthcare. And again, external validation as it is called, which not, should not be mistaken with the validation that we know in machine learning is one aspect of it, that you have to actually test it multi-site, not just with the data from one uh, hospital. Okay, thank you, Hamid. Yeah, I take this question from Raj Yakali. So uh, he said, uh, how would you suggest learning process for the small, mid-sized organization? So uh, yeah, I could respond to this uh, quite quickly. Um, yeah, no, nowadays um, the learning process, I mean, there are a lot of libraries, I mean, for developing algorithms, there are a lot of data. So the people who are tackling a particular type of task, they need to have at least some seed of information on what to do best for a particular problems, because there are a lot of algorithms out there. There are a lot of data out there. So you need to have a little bit of knowledge on what people have done for that particular problem. So a little search could uh, direct you uh, what what you need to do and what type of algorithm you need to use. As Hamid mentioned in his presentation, there are many type of approaches that you could use for the learning process of the system. There are a lot of data that are available, but you need to do a little bit of research on what people have used, what people have done with, before you embark on tackling a major problem. So that's, that's the major things that I always tell people when they are trying to uh, tackle a particular uh, issue in the area of learning process. Uh, let me take another question. Uh, so there is no question. So this is the presentation was great and incredibly informative. So the, uh, thank you. Will the slides be made available? So I think, uh, Carol, the slides will be available. I mean, this have been recorded. Is that the case? Yeah, the recording will be available after yeah, the, the recording will be available. But the slides themselves, I don't think that I mean uh, they will be shared. But there will be the movie clip of what has been presented in the first presentation or the second one. Uh, Raj Yakali, a wonderful overview with healthcare as case study. Thank you very much for your uh, comments. Okay, so now let's see if there are other 
questions here? Uh, OK, so no more questions here. Uh, OK, so there is a question by uh, Dennis here. So uh, Dennis says, uh, what AI machine learning methods you observe emerging as being used the most, being most popular in the market? Does it depend on a use case? So I, I let you answer this one, Hamid, please. Sure, uh, the, the trend seems to be to use any type of pre-trained deep neural network. So many, many applications, uh, absolute majority use a uh, pre-trained network uh, topologies like DenseNet, ResNet, Inception, and Inception, uh, and people use that mainly for a data representation. So you use a pre-trained network to represent your data, and then you can either fine-tune it if you have enough labeled data to fine-tune it, or you use other machine learning techniques like classifier, like random forest and SVM, to exploit the representation and embedding that the pre-trained network provides. That's a very, also an NLP that has been established. So you use a pre-trained BERT and then you fine tune it, you make it bio BERT and so on. So that's a general trend that, because not everybody has the possibility that the uh, deep knowledge and the computational power to train a network from scratch. Uh, we just, we just uh, 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 trained and pub uh, we will publish soon and the paper will come out in uh, a severe medical image analysis soon. We trained a network from scratch uh, using the NCI data set for histopathology. It took us almost four months full time. The entire lab was busy with that. So it's a it's a huge undertaking. Uh, people will try to not do that. Use existing deep networks that have been uh, pre-trained and then minimally fine tune them for your own purposes, either with label data or use them as so-called feature extractor as to give you the representation of your data and use uh, complementary classifiers like simple MLP SVM to uh, do perform classification. It's thus the problem uh, that you are dealing with. OK, thank you, Hamid. Uh, Terry Austin is asking, how often do you see the combination of methods like, for instance, NLP image classification? Uh, do you see synergetic benefits by combining or fusing output uh, information? So let me take this quickly and if uh, Hamid also you could add on that. Uh, from the experience that we have gathered, I mean, over uh, several years working in these fields, a lot of the times uh, the best possible type of outcome comes with the adequate fusion of uh, various techniques. One single techniques might not always provide the best possible approach. Always approaches have some shortcomings. So having synergetic benefits, I mean, by combining uh, output information is very important. Sometimes you use two, three or even four tools. Each one of them is providing a certain type of benefits for the data and then the outcome could be combined. But this is not easy to do. This is complex and you have to do a lot of testing, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, you have to do a lot of analysis for these type of approaches. But usually, I mean, from my experience, especially for complex data, the synergetic combination of various approaches provide most of the time the best possible outcome. Uh, Hamid, if you would like to comment on this as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the combination and fusion of uh, different modalities, data modality has always been an uh, ambition, but we didn't really have the tools and the big data was not available until recently. So the data from internet, the data, digitized data from hospitals, but it's well established wisdom that uh, combining different modalities does add to the accuracy and robustness and resilience of the techniques that we use. In healthcare, there is, there is no way around it. We have to combine numbers and reports and images and blood tests and everything that we get, genome, protein structure. Uh, that's the future. And I, I would say we just, as a community, we have just started on that, that the, uh, we have a lot of techniques to do that. What is missing is actually access. That's a huge problem in healthcare domain that we do not have access to large, well curated data set that are driven and created by uh, by medical experts. Uh, and I would say it takes us two, three years to get there, to have some publicly available large data sets such that researchers can go 
and do all these fantastic things by combining different modalities. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, one question from Raj, uh, Raj saying, can you please communicate the approaches being used to tackle bias in AI within healthcare? So if you can respond to this, uh, Hamid, as well. Well, well the, the bias in healthcare it has a name. Uh, we call it inter-observable variability or inter-observable variability. That if you basically, a, a hospital, first of all, could be focused on a specific type of things and come from a specific school of medicine, that's one type of bias, but the major bias, which is the major source of error, diagnostic error in uh, healthcare, is inter-observable variability. That if you give the same diagnostic case to five different doctors, you may get five different responses based on their background, their training, their expertise, and so on. So the the, the uh, how we defeat that is if you work with labeled data, and that's another reason that I personally try to avoid as much as I can supervised learning. If you do supervised learning, you have to make sure that your labels do not come from one expert. So if it comes from one expert, guaranteed you have the bias in there. So if you get labels from multiple experts, that's the absolute minimum guarantee that you get different perspective and you can reconcile the differences and come up with a smart average, so to speak, that eliminates most biases. So that's inter-observable variability is the main issue, and uh, the solution is to have multi-label uh, data sets, so label, uh, data sets that have been labeled by multiple experts. Uh, thank you, Hamid. Yeah, we spoke about several aspects, uh, trustworthiness and ethics. Uh, there is a question here uh, by Ella. Is AI trustworthy enough to find against the current pandemic and uh, future uh, pandemics? Uh, so let me answer this one before I give you, uh, I mean, so very quickly, I mean, uh, AI, I mean, in certain several type of application have shown its capability of dealing with, I mean, many type of application. One of them is medical diagnosis on how to deal with outbreaks. Uh, whether AI is trustworthy enough, I mean, it's a big question because uh, the, the, there are, I mean, this aspect of the black box things for uh, deep, deep learning that hasn't been resolved fully, but there are a lot of algorithms now that uh, come equipped with uh, several type of modules make the system more transparent. So yes, I would say that we are tending into that direction and the AI is becoming more and more trustworthy. But as Hamid mentioned, we have always to get support and expertise from people who develop these type of technologies and also from experts who make the diagnosis of these systems. Uh, if you would like to comment, Hamid, uh, quickly on this. Yeah, that's it. We have, we have some concern within the AI community. Everybody knows, for example, adversarial attacks could be one thing, bias could be another thing, uh, limited labels could be another thing, overfitting, which is memorizing a solution because our networks are gigantic. Uh, BERT that I mentioned has 110 million parameters. Um, and when you optimize a system with 110 million parameters, 10 years ago, as Professor Carey was mentioning at the beginning, that was not imaginable. Now we are doing that with using all those fantastic tricks. So, but the danger is there that we overfit, that we memorize sometime, and if we don't properly validate, that may stay. So these are, these are concerns that uh, everybody in the healthcare takes very seriously. And that's why uh, everything that you do in healthcare will be double and triple check. But everything starts with a well curated data set, a data set that comes from hospital, that comes from the expert, not, uh, not done by us. It's not for us computer scientists and engineers to do that. We have the technology, but the data and knowledge has to come from hospitals. Yeah, thank you, Hamid. This question, next question is for you, Hamid. It says, you mentioned the need for vast amounts of data to support the more scalable and supervised methods of learning. Can you provide some commentary uh, comments on the political landscape around privacy of personal data and how this will impact the evolution? It will be unfair to you to respond to this, but if you have some uh, some some comments on that, Hamid. Sure, it has been a frustrating experience for myself at least and many other colleagues that I know of to get your hands on uh, data from the clinics and hospitals is not easy. The first line of concern is, of course, always privacy, which is the concern of all of us. All of us could be at some point a patient and in a hospital or a loved one, so it's a concern for everybody. But we have technologies to make sure, and there are questions, there are procedures, there are retrospective agreements. If somebody, if you have the data from 10 years ago, how it can be used to uh, 
uphold ethical views and privacy protections. And uh, recently in many hospitals, then we have forms that we always ask, explicitly ask patients, do you want to share your data? You don't want to share your data. I do not see privacy protection as the major obstacle based on my experience with five, six hospitals that I'm dealing with. The main obstacle is actually hospitals have still a, a type of silo uh, uh, thinking. Uh, and I say that out loud as a critic. And they realize there is a huge potential and arguably and justifiably, they want to be part of that major change, which is perfectly all right. So they they want to they don't want to lose control over data. They want to be part of the design a consortium that comes up with that data curation, which is fantastic. And we want to have it, but we don't have the procedures in place. We don't have the rules. We don't have the framework. There are there are no consortium when we back in the 90s created DICOM standard for medical imaging multiple institutions got together sat down discussed and created the rules we need similar consortium symposium bodies agencies entities to do the same thing so lack of procedures not privacy concern we have the technology for anonymizing we have protocols we have ethic rules we have ethic review boards all that is in place, but there is the channel of communication between healthcare institutions and research and industry. This is not well established. We have a lot of work to do in that regard. Very good. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you. I am not seeing uh, further question here. Uh, so. So if yeah, I, I might ask you, Hamid, the question, I mean, if I may. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, from your experience and from I mean, uh, the way you have been dealing with institutions, as you as you just mentioned, uh, in order, I mean, to see further growth in this particular area where people are uh, seeing innovation of AI in medical diagnosis to, to help systems, expert systems or deep learning structure or, or whatever. What do you see most importantly needed from uh, governments, from companies, from institutions? What, what is how, how do you see that uh, being made in order to provide the next the future of this type of technology, which has a lot of promises? Well, well the challenge, uh, the challenge seems to be that uh, no single institution or entity, so be it the government or healthcare industry or universities uh, or big companies uh, who, have, who have a stake in AI but are not in explicitly in uh, healthcare, none of them can do it alone so yeah. and that's the main challenge we need uh, government needs to plan for major investment private sector seems to be investing quite nicely and when i yeah. look at the landscape in us they are doing their job the private uh, sector has recognized the potential and they are investing hospitals are behind we are behind as research institution we have to do a lot more we have to start uh, conversations and see how we can combine the forces and this is where initiatives are necessary. These big changes do not come with one or two students in one small lab. We need uh, initiatives that then one or two hospitals with one or two universities put together and we get enough funds such that we can uh, establish a major uh, research for specific application. Uh, among others, curation of data is costly. It doesn't matter if it's raw or labeled. So those initiatives are missing and uh, uh, um, most likely uh, you know, uh, governments are right after us, healthcare institutions and research institutions have to start talking and government has to back it up with some sort of support. But I see in, in this between, I see that actually private sector is doing the best job. So they, they have recognized the opportunity and they are investing. Yes, excellent. Thank you. This question for you, Hamid, as well uh, from Ala, Dr. Ala. Do you see a need to combine traditional disease models with data-driven models in case of COVID-19? Um, never say never. Yes, everything is possible. We don't want to dismiss uh, old technologies from hand. Again, the best example for me are expert systems. Uh, uh, and uh, in many cases, we do not have enough data to use a sophisticated deep learning technique. So we have to rely back on good old-fashioned AI and say, OK, we, here we can combine a small expert system a traditional modeling or um, use also decision tree if you want and then combine it in other part other side with uh, sophisticated modern machine learning techniques definitely and in terms of COVID 
we don't know a lot of stuff. So uh, the, the, the ignorance is much higher than what we know. And uh, so we can get all help that we need. So we have to combine all the new uh, to combat this. And as the example that I mentioned as the as the last thing that I like to say again, so we getting access to our industrial collaborator to the largest archive, the archive of the Department of Defense uh, Joint Pathology Center contains biopsy samples from Spanish flu. So and next year wow. we are supposed to index one million of those biopsy samples. Uh, with our uh, partner here on digital pathology and looking at those cases, bringing that knowledge, combine it with the, what we know from COVID, that's the type of things that we need to do. And then suddenly, hopefully we have a uh, breakthrough. These are not things that one or two research groups can do. This is this requires many, many entities to come to the same table. Yeah, thank you, Hamid, for your answer. As we are closing this uh, webinar, I mean, uh, for today, uh, yeah, I would like to summarize very, very quickly. So we have gone through an overview of AI and uh, our colleague Hamid has uh, introduced, I mean, some of his work uh, because he has done a lot of work in this particular field on how to use AI and machine learning in the field of uh, health uh, care system. He has used, I mean, the image recognition AI technology that he has worked on, but a number of templates of what has been described by Hamid in terms of uh, the data availability, the uh, trustworthiness of the data in various type of field apply to other applications as well, whether it's financial, whether in manufacturing or whether in uh, secure type of environment. So many of what has been spoken here today could apply to a number of uh, various type of under industries. Of course, we don't have a lot of time to go over many applications, but uh, this template has shown you what can be done with the tools of AI and machine learning, mostly, I mean, deep learning uh, type of approaches and uh, the future growth of these type of techniques and uh, their application to various type of uh, industry. I would like to thank first uh, Hamid for his excellent presentation. Uh, I would like also to thank all our attendees and uh, partners and uh, the excellent questions that have been made uh, during this uh, webinar. And uh, we would like uh, our uh, partners, uh, industrial partners, to uh, we would like to welcome them to attend uh, the next uh, webinar uh, in our webinar series, which are going to come uh, on uh, during November time frame. And my uh, co-director and my colleague uh, Peter Van Beek is going to present those uh, ones when they come. Th thank you very much for uh, attending today's, uh, today's webinar. And if you have any questions for any of us, please uh, let us know and we'll be happy to interact with you uh, offline as well. Thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.